that if people are not listening to you, stop talking to them. That is the best piece of advice that I can give you. And if you stop talking to people who aren't listening to you and start watching them instead, they will tell you what they're up to. But so if you have things to say, say them, but you find people that will listen, talk to them. The ones who aren't listening, pull back because you're devaluing what you have to say by offering it to an audience that does nothing but reject it. And that's a good guideline to life in general. So pull back. The eagle spreads its wings as something to behold. It was built to soar, to fly. It was built to withstand storms. So that when the storm comes and other birds run for shelter, the eagle runs into the storm and uses the storm to lift it up so that it can fly above the storm. You know you're an eagle when you ran into a storm that you thought was going to kill you, and instead of it killing you, it lifted you higher than you've ever been lifted before. It's a sure sign you're an eagle. Can you hear me tonight? What you need is another eagle with wings and dreams and visions and concepts who's not jealous of you who's not intimidated by you, who's not fighting you. You know that it's an eagle when they're not jealous of you. You know it's another eagle when they can pray for you and help you to get to the next level. It's only the chickens that are down on the ground talking about everybody. So don't be frustrated when you see the chickens flapping up and falling down because at this stage in your life, it's time for you to be synergistic with other eagles. you're an eagle you're meant to rise up we don't rise up when everything's going well we rise up regardless you're trained to rise up on your worst day that's who you are in the worst of circumstances no place for whining complaining being anxious being negative it's totally unnecessary Eagles live on another level. Eagles think on another level. Eagles dream on another level. Eagles function on another level. If you had somebody reject you, leave you, stop crying about it. It was just a chicken. All your circumstances may say you'll never fly. You don't have the training, the experience. Thoughts will tell you you'll always be grounded. Now get ready, your wings are coming. Where you are is not permanent. God did not create you to crawl, to go through life lonely, struggling. He created you to soar, to take new ground, to go further than you thought possible. Now quit being discouraged by what you see. What you see is subject to change. You don't know what God is up to. You don't know what he's doing behind the scenes. No one can live beyond the limits of their belief. So if you want to live beyond what you're living now, you have to change your belief system. The secret to anyone rising is what happens in their belief system. Your life is what you think it should be. That's exactly what you are right now. You are what you thought you should be. And if you don't like who you are, you got to change what you think you should be. That's how leaders are born. When a caterpillar transforms into a butterfly, gets its wings, it doesn't just have the ability to crawl faster, just be better at what it could already do. It comes into a whole new dimension from crawling to flying. When you get your wings, you're not going to just be better at what you can do right now. God is going to catapult you into a new dimension, into favor that you haven't seen. Things are going to happen sooner than you thought. Should have taken you a lifetime to pay your house off, but you did it in a fraction of the time. What happened? You went from crawling to flying. You got your wings. You're going to discover gifts, talents, creativity that you didn't know you had. Where you think, where did this come from? You got your wings. That's God taking you places that you could never go on your own. You know, courage mounts up and then sometimes we have the doubts that creep in and we reach a little deeper to find that courage that overcomes our doubts and our fears. So I would probably debate a little bit with Napoleon on this unwavering courage.
because sometimes courage does waver. But as long as it stays, as long as the, in the end there it is to serve you, the courage to do what you didn't think you could do, the courage to step into territory that might be a little unfamiliar, the courage to talk to somebody you don't know, the courage to attempt conducting a meeting, the courage to give your first testimonial, the courage to uh, solve problems you couldn't solve before, that kind of courage, the courage to stand up when it's sort of dark in your corner, the courage to do it when it isn't going your way seemingly, the courage to try to have a good day in the midst of a bad day, that kind of courage. Wavering a little at times, yes, because we all have doubts that attack us. We all have uh, small fears that creep in. That is the nature of life. But that's what faith is all about. That's what courage is all about, to serve us. When our doubts will not serve us with faith to overcome fear and courage to overcome our doubts. Your leadership development is determined by, number one, your perception of who you are, number two, by why you think you exist, and number three, your sense of significance. I am giving you my secret to life right here. You got to first change your perception of who you are, and that starts with a belief system. Secondly, you must change your perception of why you think you exist. And number three, your sense of significance. No matter where you are right now, it doesn't matter. I don't care what situation you're in now, where you're working, or what situation you're in. If you get these three things to come alive in this session, when I see you again, you'll have a story to tell me. If you're a person where all your friends come to you with their problem, that's because they see something in you. You're more balanced and stable. But you gotta remember this old saying, if you're the smartest person in your group, you need a new group. It ain't nothing bad, you just got to upgrade people in your life. You cannot be the go-to person in the group. So, you know, just upgrade your friends. Don't worry about it. You have a gift. You, have to, you solve problems all the time. You know what people pay for in this country? They pay for expertise in this country. The moment you're an expert at something in America, you can make a million dollars. All you got to do is be an expert at one thing. Because we all have this warfare going on. You know, it's going on in the world, the warfare between liberty and tyranny. Uh, in our own body, the warfare between health and illness, the struggle is on. Uh, the struggle between light and darkness, the struggle between good and evil. I call it opposites in conflict. And as soon as you're born into the world, as soon as you find yourself and discover yourself on this spinning planet headed somewhere, you know that this exists. To be a civilized society, we must drive the dark side of our nature into a small corner and let the positive side flourish. Early, we must learn to exercise self-control. Uh, power is a wonderful thing, but it must be exercised properly. It must be exercised to benefit, not to destruction, so that you can become the best example. The example of having your temper well-managed, to having that dark side of your nature under control, the best example of choosing wise words and not being careless, that kind of control. Control of your appetite, control of your desires, so that they fit into the positive side of life and not the negative side. Self-control, very important. Now here's the next three. Willingness to assume full responsibility. All of us have been taught that, to take full, 100%, responsibility. What happened to me might not have been my responsibility, but what I do about it is my full responsibility. If a hailstorm destroys the farmer's crop, he wasn't responsible for that. But his responsibility now begins when the hailstorm is over, when he asks the question of himself, what should I do now? Now that this catastrophe is over, now that the damage is done, now what should I do about it? And a philosophy I've taught all these years, it's not what happens to you that determines your future. It's what you do about what happens that determines your future. And this is a major part of it, accepting full responsibility. Also, you've got to be responsible for your future. Nobody's going to fix it. No one else is going to design it. 
no one else is going to come along and say, hey, I will make sure it all works well for you. You've got to take all the input, you've got to take all the testimonials, all the teaching, all the training, all the influence, then you've got to have the responsibility of designing your life. You can design a life of prosperity, or you can design a life just to coast and get by. The responsibility belongs to you. Discover that you are important to the human race, you are important to the world, you are important to your universe. You can never fully carry out the mandate of leadership if you don't have the mentality of leadership. It's about mentality. A matter of fact, integrating attitude and at aptitude and altitude produces leadership. That's a lot of ops there. First of all, your attitude got to be right. Then you must marry that to attributes. That means gifts you were born with. Then you got to marry that to aptitude. That means now you got to educate and train those gifts. That's why you read, study, and go to school for your aptitude to be increased. And then your altitude means you got to change the level of associations you are in. Here's the key to the good life. Learn to put everything you've got into everything you do. Whatever you are doing, pour it on. It will quickly open up into opportunity or quickly disclose to you that you ought to be doing something else. Here's the next attitude disease, indecision, mental paralysis. The guy can't make up his mind and it becomes a disease. Pretty soon he knows he's got it. A life full of adventure is a life full of many decisions. The ones that turn out to be wrong give you better experience to make better decisions. So don't see how many decisions you can get out of, see how many you can get into. That's where the adventure is. So shake off this disease, indecision. The next one is doubt. And one of the worst is self-doubt. There are many, but that's one of the worst. The guy doubts himself, doubts if he can do that well, doubts if he can make that much, doubts if he can accomplish all that. A chronic, excellent self-doubter. You can imagine what damage that does to your future. So here's the key. Turn this coin over and become a believer. And there's many things to believe in. One of the majors is yourself. The understanding of self-worth is the beginning of progress. Sometimes it's so easy to focus on how we lost during the day. Sometimes it's so easy to focus on, here's all the things that I did wrong for myself. A lot of us do that a lot. We beat ourselves up. We're like, hey, we didn't eat right today. It's a loss for the day. Hey, I didn't work out. It's a loss for the day. Hey, I didn't study today. It's a loss for the day. And I think so many times we beat ourselves up for all of our shortcomings when we really need to be focusing on what we did right. Uh, for a lot of us out there, we all have big goals and we're chasing after greatness in our life. And it's like, hey, in order for me to make change in my life, it's this big, overwhelming obstacle. And we're like, hey, I'm here, I need to get to here and I wanna make all that jump at once. When in truth, your success is not one big jump. It's actually a bunch of small, consistent steps. You continuing to show up for yourself. My mother said, Leslie, if you run around with nine broke people, I guarantee you, you'll be caught number two. Well, come to find out, Mama was right. She only had a third grade education. But the studies indicate that you earn within two to three thousand dollars of your closest friends. So poverty and living a mediocre life is communicated mind to mind. And so your relationships can hold you down or they can lift you up. I teach people to practice the principle of OQP, only quality people. If you're the smartest one in your group, you need to get a new group. Your perception of who you are, you've got to change it. And most of our perceptions are other people's concepts of us, and therefore we don't have self-concept, we got other concepts. What is your perception of who you are? And the second one, why do you think you exist? You've got to discover that you were born for something some reason there's some purpose for your life if you don't discover that you'll always have a job and we'll bury you in an average grave with an average tombstone then he said a leader must have a keen sense of justice how very true justice we become familiar with you know even when we're small when certain things that happened or were done to us that we Something told us that wasn't right. Something did us, someone did us wrong. We have that sense of right and wrong, and it starts very early. Then we have to have that sense of utilizing what's right and what's wrong so that we develop this sense of justice, this sense of being fair, this sense of being on the positive side, on the right side. 
uh, to minimize a person's mistakes, they need to have this sense of justice. It's been a catastrophe in the last 6,000 years, uh, the governments that resorted to power instead of democracy, that resorted to intimidation instead of freedom. And we all know the terrible toll that that takes. But it takes a toll not only politically in a country or politically around the world, but it takes a toll even in enterprise. It takes a toll in school if a teacher is unfair. It takes a toll in working on a team where someone is unfair or where the leadership is not fair in the administration of justice. So this is true. A keen sense of justice and what's fair and what's right. Part of this we have to learn as we go. You know, you don't have it all the first year. You haven't got it all the second year, the third year. After all the years that I've, you know, been around, uh, both as a human being and as a, as a business person, we're still, even at these years, trying to decide what's best, what's fair, what's right, uh, to give balance to our life and to build on a firm foundation for the future. So I agree with Napoleon good idea, a sense of justice. Here's another one he said, definiteness of decision. Indecision is the thief of opportunity. If you don't decide, the opportunity could slip away. If you don't decide what you're going to do today, the day could get away and you're not very effective. Is it possible to finish the day before you start it? And the answer is yes. If you don't finish it to the best of your ability, have some idea, some good plan, sure enough, the day escapes, and in the morning you say, let's see, what should I do now? In the afternoon you say, hey, time's getting away from me, what should I do now? And now most of the day is lost. Most of the day escapes not being utilized and uh, doesn't work for you simply because uh, you didn't make those decisions early at the early part of the day. The decisions we make in the early part of our life sometimes last for a lifetime. If you neglect them and don't make them, sure enough, the time passes and the opportunity sometimes is diminished and sometimes you spend a lot of time now catching up simply because you didn't make those early decisions. So it's the decisions at the first of the day, it's the decisions at the early part of the month, it's the decisions at the early part of the year that greatly determines what kind of year you're gonna have. The decisions you make in the early days of your marriage, sometimes those are the decisions that affect the marriage for a lifetime. The decisions you make at the first chance you see opportunity, those decisions, what you're going to do with it, how far you're going to take it, what it's going to be uh, meaning to you in the years to come. Those early decisions are vitally important. Then we need decisions to correct poor decisions, to overcome our mistakes. It's possible, of course, for all of us to make unwise decisions. And at the end of one year, at the end of one week, one month, or at the end of a few years, we say, that decision cost me too much, cost me a lot of time, cost me a lot of money, uh, cost me maybe a good relationship, uh, cost me a chance to be productive. But as long as you're alive, there's still a chance to use new decision power to correct the mistakes of decisions that were bad in the past. All of us have the opportunity to do that, but I think Napoleon was right here too. You got to be definite in making decisions so that the opportunity doesn't pass you by. Take advantage. Here's the next one. Napoleon Hill said, a good leader has definite plans. How important that is. Uh, don't let this momentum pass you by. Don't let this momentum go uncashed in on. Uh, don't let it be like a lost cause for you. And maybe you've, because of the lack of plans have lost a month or two, or you've lost a week or two, or maybe you've lost a year and you were 10% effective instead of 100%. Now's the time to change all that and start making some plans. You gotta have some plans for your family, right? You got to take your family along, don't leave them out. One of the challenges all of us have in making our plans is how to balance everything to make sure that we don't regret at the end of the year, I spent too much time on that. I spent too much money. And then if you have, say, how can I not do that again? And construct some better plans uh, so that you won't have any regrets at the end of a year to come, five years to come, three or four, five years to come. Definite plans. Plans for the use of your money, 
so that you find yourself secure regardless of what happens. I agree with Napoleon here, you got to have good plans. One more on plans, and that is the plan for your personal development. The plan to be better this year than last year. The plan to take the classes, attend the, the workshops, do everything you possibly can to show personal progress. Not just financial progress, not just the progress of having one more car or one more home, but the progress of personality, the progress of communication skills, uh, the progress in how to deal with people, progress in using your influence so that it multiplies its power by five by 10 versus what it used to be. You need those kind of plans. A plan for personal growth, personal development, a plan to be all that you can possibly be in the years to come as you develop in your life business and your family business, all of that. You've got to have good plans. Next, Napoleon Hill had a good saying. It was something my father had and passed it on to me as a good philosophy. And here's what he said. A good leader has the habit of doing more than what he gets paid for. What an incredible philosophy this is. The habit of doing more than you get paid for. It's what we call the service that you put out like seeds in the ground that doesn't bring the harvest immediately, but the harvest is yet to come. It's called like putting out the capital in capitalism. Doing more than you get paid for means that you're getting ready for the next move up. Because if you do more than you get paid for, you've made an investment. The average person might think if I do more than the company requires, uh, you know, then they're ripping me off. You know, I'm not getting paid for that extra time, that extra attention. But you must not view it that way. You must say I'm getting there a little earlier, staying a little later as an investment in my own personal future because I want that kind of reputation. I want that kind of philosophy to work in my life. Do more than you get paid for. So what you don't get paid for, don't worry about that. Just render the service with the vision of the future that it'll come back multiplied if you have this kind of habit, this kind of philosophy. Next, Napoleon Hill talks about personality. You need a pleasing personality. There's many parts to your personality. One is your working personality. You know, the kind of behavior, the kind of attitude that you need, especially in the public. Some things you can kind of get by with being a little careless, maybe in private, but in public where it counts so much in your paycheck, it counts so much in building your business for the future, your own personality. But here's what you also must remember. You develop your personality in private so that it serves you well in the public. Sometimes we get the mistaken idea, I can be careless with just these few and be more careful when I have a thousand. But see, that doesn't work that way. Careless with a few, sure enough, that will creep into your presentation for a thousand people. Uh, the influence you have one-on-one, -on -one, that's what really counts. You say, well, I'm only talking to two people, it doesn't matter much. That's when it really matters. Because if you'll practice well there, using your personality, using your influence, to get someone's attention, to get them to listen, uh, to get them to participate, the kind of personality that someone says, I'd like to be around this person. Uh, they're unusual, they're not like the average person I meet on my everyday experience, that kind of personality. But you've got to practice it behind the scenes. You've got to practice it one-on-one. -on -one. And if you're effective one-on-one, one-on-three, -on -one, one-on-five, I promise you, that will get you ready to now perform with the kind of personality, the kind of charisma that wins people when you're in front of 500 people, 1,000 people, 5,000. So this is a good point, working on your personality. Next, Napoleon Hill said a leader needs sympathy and understanding. We have to develop that early in our lives. All of our lives, we have to look at those that are less fortunate than we are, those who need a helping hand, and especially now we learn to look at those who need an opportunity, those who need a change in their health, those who need a change in their life and in their lifestyle. That kind of leadership quality is so powerful. That kind of understanding 
stand. Now here's the last one. Napoleon Hill said, a major attribute of leadership is vision. Vision is in many parts. One, a vision for your own course to follow. A vision for you, for yourself. A vision for your financial future. A vision for your health. A vision for your wealth. A vision for you to latch on to and make something out of. A vision for your family. Because vision must now lift others as well as ourselves. Guess what our family is counting on? That we'll be able to see things that at first they cannot see. That we'll be able to look further into the future than perhaps they will be able to look. The same is true with your organization, the people that are around you. They're counting on your vision. Perhaps you've been there a little longer than they have. Maybe you've been there a lot longer than they have. And they will look to you to help them see things that they can't see in the beginning. And if you will do that, develop that attribute of leadership, I'm telling you, you'll have such a dramatic effect on your organization, it will be unbelievable. A vision for yourself, a vision for your family, a vision for your organization, a vision for the people that you're close to. In 2006, when my injury happened, a lot of people looked at my response and they thought it was something to be admired, right? But when I looked at the situation, the beauty of it, at a certain point in my life, I was like, God, what is this, right? At one point, the puzzle started to make sense. Man, it looks as if I'm gonna be a first round draft pick. At cornerback, I'm calling my mother, hey mom, I'm going to the NFL, we'll never struggle again. And then I get on the other side of the injury and it looks as if like, God, what's up? It was as if God was saying, trust me, I got you. And I was like, I get that, God, but let me get the contract, and then I'll trust you. And God was like, no, I got something sweeter for you. It might be a little hard. It might take a little bit longer, but I just need you to trust me. And I'm like, I get that part, but my mother's working at Wendy's. I really want to help my mother. I got a little sister. She's here today. She goes to Tennessee State. Like, I really want to help my mother and my little sister. God was like, no, I got you. And so now when I look at it, I'm like, man, I'm so foolish. Like, God had it planned all along. As soon as I hit campus, God was like, let me get him in discipleship. Let me start preparing him for the battle before the battle even happens. Let me put victory in his spirit and in his mindset so when the injury happened, his perspective is already shifting. Let me get him prepared for it so when it happens, he can step back and see the bigger picture. And so the beauty of it was when Coach Foreman came to see me in the hospital, and I love it, Coach Foreman came to see me and he shook my hand. He said to me, Ink, how you doing? I said, Coach, I'm blessed. He said, you sure, buddy? I was like, yeah, I'm good. I was like, I gave everything. I'm good. He was like, you sure? I was like, yeah, coach, I'm good. And he walked out and I could tell he was trying to figure it out. Like, man, why did he say that? And the beauty of it was when it happened, automatically something popped in my head that said, Inky, remember James chapter one, when it says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kind, because the testing of your faith produces perseverance and perseverance must finish this race so that you may be complete and lacking nothing. So in other words, you got to go through something in order to turn into the individual that God wants you to become. And I used to share with people all the time. I said, man, it's cute to quote scripture, but it's another thing when life puts you in a situation and you got to live it. And I noticed immediately God at work, immediately, because I was in a room with my mother and my father and my whole life, my mother had despised my father because my father left her when she was 16 she had me. And so I was this all-star athlete and my mother and my father couldn't even be in the same room. And for the first time in their life, they had to be in the same room without the foolishness, without worrying about what the next person is gonna think. They're in a room because they're not realizing or they don't know what's about to transpire and they don't know if their son is gonna live or die. They don't know if he's gonna get his arm amputated. They don't know anything. And my mother is sitting there and she's crying. And my father is lying on the floor and his back is to, on the floor and his head is to the ceiling. And out of my father's mouth were the words, Ruby, I'm sorry. He said, you did a great job raising that boy. And I was like, God, I don't know what this is, but I know that's you. Because you got to feel me. Every time they were around each other, it was like a rock rowler and a chihuahua. And my mother was the rock rowler, right? And so when it happened, immediately, I knew it was God. Immediately. 
I didn't know what was about to happen, but I knew God was in the midst of the situation immediately. And the only thing I was trying to do was stay out of God's way and navigate the situation. I knew immediately when my teammates came to see me, it was an opportunity to witness and they were going to look at me and see how is it going to respond in this situation. I knew immediately if I responded in the right way, Romans 8.28 could be in full effect. And we know that all things work to the good of those who love the Lord, who are called according to his will and his purpose. I knew immediately. And my father said to me, because the million dollar question I always get everywhere that I go, people say to me, Inky, come on, man, tell me, you, you'll change what happened to you, right? Because I always say, man, I wouldn't change what happened to me for the world. I always say, this is the third best thing that's ever happened to me outside of marrying my wife and having my two children. And people would pull me off to the side in the back and say, Ink, tell me, keep it real with me. You'll change it, right? Like, yeah, I paralyzed right on my hand, man. People pull me off, Ink, be real, man. If you could be in the NFL right now, making millions of dollars, you'll change that, right? And I'm like, no, I wouldn't change what happened to me for nothing. Let me tell you why. When my injury happened, my father said to me in the hospital, Inky, uh, I'm going to come and stay with you for the next 30 days. He said, I'm going to just help you. Whatever you need help with, man. Washing clothes, whatever you need, I'm going to help. Now, my father had never spoken like this, had never did anything like this. And I'll never forget, my father said something to the extent one day of, and how could this God um, let this happen to you? Like, my father wasn't a believer like that his whole life. It's like, Ink, I, I see you go to church and you give glory to God. Like, how could this God let this happen to you, man? Like, I see you go to FCA, Fellowship of Christian Athletes. Like, how could this God, like, let this happen to you, man? I call you on Saturday night, see if you're out at a bar, and you tell me you're in with your roommates and y'all doing some stuff for discipleship. Like, how could this God let this happen to you, man? Like, how could this God let this happen? And I'm like, man, God about to spank him. But I knew the 30 days that my father wanted to come stay with me, as bad as it may sound, it wasn't so much about my father coming and assisting, even though I know he wanted to assist, as much as it was about my father coming to say, let me see how he responds now. Like I'm on the fence with my faith. My father at the time, I'm on the fence with my faith. People are talking about this God thing. I'm trying to figure it out. I really can't comprehend it. I see bad things happening to people that I consider to be good people. So let me try to figure it out. It's somebody I love, somebody I respect. Now they're going through an extreme level of opposition and they've lost the thing that we both place our identity in. And so, yeah, I want to help him, but I really want to see how he's going to respond to the opposition. And he says he's a believer. Now I want to see if he's still going to pray at night. Now I want to see if he's still going to say glory to God. Now I want to see if he's still going to say, hey man, can you tell me, take me to Fellowship of Christian Athletes? I knew it. And my father would take me to Fellowship of Christian Athletes. He would drop me off and he'll say, I'll wait out here. Ink, I'll be waiting on you. He would take me to church and say, hey, Ink, I'll be waiting on you. He would go to rehab and I would go to rehab. He would lay down on the table and they would be putting heat packs on his back. And they would put a heat pack on, put a heat pack on. And I'll never forget one day we're in the training room and they're putting so many heat packs on his back that when they pull the heat packs up, his back was completely raw because he was carrying a burden that wasn't his to carry in the first place. He was trying to carry opposition that wasn't his to carry in the first place, but because he had no connection, it's like Wi-Fi. He couldn't connect, so he didn't have anybody to give it to, and his ego was in full effect, edging God out. His ego was in full effect, and it was breaking him. Every single day, he went from 6'3", 250, to every single day, his back got lower and lower. And every single night, the routine was the same. I would get on my knees, I would pray at the same time. And my father would get up and he would walk by Ramon Foster's room, 67375. And he would say, hey, big boy, you good? Ramon would say, I'm good, Pop. He would walk by my room, he would say, ain't you good? I would say, yes, sir, I'm good. He said, all right, good night. Every single night, on the 29th day, my number was 29. My favorite Bible verse is Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in the future. On the 29th day, the day before my father was scheduled to leave, I hear my father, hey, big boy, you good? Ramon says, I'm good, Pop. He walks by my room. I'm on my knees on the side of my bed getting ready to pray. He said, ain't you good? I said, yes, sir, I'm good. He goes to walk off and he comes back. He steps in. He says, hey, ain't. I said, yes, sir. He said, you know that, uh, that God you pray to? Yep. So you know that God you go to? Uh, discipleship FCA about I said yes sir you know that God I take you to church about yep he said if that God can help you handle this situation the way you handling it he said son I want to give my life Christ <laughs> I 
that not only did my father get saved and corrected his household, he had a wife and he had two daughters. And so when a person says to me, NFL or my father's salvation, 10 out of 10 times, I'm going to choose my father's salvation. When somebody say to me, NFL or my teammate's salvation, 10 out of 10 times, I'm going to choose my teammate's salvation. Like, I wasn't a great teammate. Hear me, young people that play sports. I wasn't a great teammate because of my athletic ability. I was a great teammate because I pushed my teammates in every aspect of their life. I didn't want us to just be great football players because I understood who we were as people was far more valuable than who we were as football players. I understood at one point it was going to have to end whether we wanted it to or not, and we had to have an identity of something that was a lot greater than sports, right? Like, I went through it for real. Like, this is not lip service. Like, I was in a hospital with six cuts down my left thigh, one cut across the left side of my neck, one across the right, twice through my right ribs, cut out my right pec, bottom of my armpit to the bottom of my hand, 350 staples in my body. Saturday night, I was running a 4-3-8-40. Sunday morning, I was grabbing my father's shoulder, and I was trying to learn how to walk again, walking laps around UT Medical's hospital. I was bench pressing 350 pounds to Sunday morning, waking up, and I couldn't feel my arm, and I would go to sleep early every single day because I thought it was a bad dream. Until they told me, son, you got to break your plexus avulsion, and you ruptured your subclavian artery in your chest, and we got to take the main vein out of your left leg, plug it into your chest in order to save your life, or you won't be here in the morning. And they came to me and said, Inky, if we could just get you to assisted daily living. I said, what is that? They said, if we could just get you to the point to where you can get a grocery bag when you're with your wife and you can tuck the grocery bag under your arm, that'll be a win for us. They said, if we could just get you to a point that you can grab a pen or a pencil and you could just put your hand on it and write like a kid, that'll be a plus for us. It says, so here's the catch. We can put you in a two-year process from Knoxville to the Mayo Clinic, and we'll order you every piece of equipment on the face of this planet for your arm. So they're the best doctors in the world, right? I said, what's the catch? They said, the catch is this, Inky. We can't guarantee you after the two years that your arm will work. We can't guarantee you after the two years that your fingers will flex. We can't guarantee you after the two years that you will have filling in your back, in your arm, in your shoulder. We can't guarantee any of that. It's a break your plexus. Nobody knows what's about to happen. They said, go to 10 people that you value and you respect and ask them their advice. I went to 10 people. I said, listen, man, here's the situation. What do you think? All 10 told me, Inky, don't do it. And I understood it. They cared about me. They loved me. I said, why? They said, they can't guarantee you that your arm will work. Why will you go through that? They said, they can't guarantee you all of this equipment is going to help you. Why would you go through that? And I remember responding to them in the fact of, man, I thought courage was the ability to start something without any guarantee of success. I thought courage was the ability to embrace a process and eliminate the reward. I said, so I get that, but I'm going to do it. And I started down the path to do it. And I'm an energetic guy. I'm a passionate guy, right? And so one day they would have an arm skateboard for me. I would get on the arm skateboard, do the exercises. I would jump up off the table, go to the PT. And I would say, JD, what you got for me, man? And he would say, ain't come back tomorrow. The next day, they will have some contraption, some type of balloon contraption. I'll get on it. I'll do it. I'll get up off the table. JD, what you got for me, man? Come back tomorrow. It's almost two years. Until one day, I get up off the table after exercise. I go over to JD, and I say, JD, what you got for me, man? And JD walks off. And I jog over to him, and I remember grabbing his shoulder, and I started to turn him around. And when he turned around, he was crying. And he said to me, Ink, I'm sorry to tell you, but you will probably never be able to use that arm and that hand another day for the rest of your life. And I said to him, physically. He said, what you mean, physically? I said, physically, my right hook is out of commission. I said, physically, JD, um, I can't do some of the things I want to do. Now, let's talk about content. Because no matter what you're doing in this room, you're gonna have to produce it to achieve what you want. The problem is, there's a lot of ways to produce content. One of the biggest issues that I'm excited to address here is in a world where Instagram does extremely well, or YouTube, people think pictures and videos are the only way to go. I'm here to tell you that two of the places I'm most excited about are the written word and audio. If you are not comfortable taking tons of pictures and videos, you immediately have to make a decision here today. Are you a good writer? And if you are, I have a lot of good news for you. I'll go to that minute. Or two, if you like to talk, however you're uncomfortable with video, I couldn't be, back to your clapping, more passionate about the last six months in Indonesia, the consumption of podcasting in this country is exploding. The, the unbelievable ease 
to produce a podcast and distribute it in 2019 is remarkable. There's an app I've been talking about a long time. It just got bought by Spotify called Anchor. You literally, it's called Anchor. You can download it on your phone. You literally record on your phone. You press two more buttons and it puts it all over to the different podcast. No friction. You could be doing it right now. So the excuse of I don't know how to do it or how do I produce it or do I have to go to the radio station and how do I, do? nothing. Cost of entry, zero. Friction, zero. Literally, all you have to do is Google, how do I use Anchor or download it. I highly recommend, if you have something to say about some category, I highly recommend getting very serious about podcasts because I believe that audio over the next decade is gonna be one of the biggest ways we consume because we don't like wasting time. Humans love efficiency and audio saves time. Audio is exploding and will continue to explode and I highly recommend you look at it seriously. Another thing that's interesting to me is actually a little tidbit I don't share very often, but I always say watch what I do, not what I say. When I looked at the hashtag or the comments for this conference, I looked at a bunch of accounts. The number one mistake I believe people are doing on Instagram right now is not leaving enough written copy. The number, if you look at my posts, when I post a picture or video on Instagram, I write a lot of copy. I don't do that for my health. I don't like wasting three minutes. I do it because it matters. So I know a lot of you are trying to build your Instagram. One of the best tidbits I can give you is please start adding two, three, four, five, six, seven sentences to your post. Add context, add clarity, add a little story. You will see substantial returns. Speaking of written, how many people here are on LinkedIn? Raise your hands. Quite a few. If you're paying attention to me, you might have noticed literally I've talked about LinkedIn more in the last four months than I have in the last seven years. LinkedIn's content business, it's business, and even if you're a fitness influencer, there's a way to do business content. Write an article, six things a traveling business woman and man can do when they're in a hotel room. So you can always make your content fit. LinkedIn organic reach on content is very high, very high. I highly recommend everybody here get serious about their LinkedIn. I know a lot of you haven't signed in in three years, four years. The LinkedIn that many of us grew up with was just to get a job. It is now about business content. And I believe whether, again, you sell rugs or sneakers or wine, there's a way to write content for LinkedIn. Remember, the mindset of the person on LinkedIn is business, so you have to consider that it's different than Instagram, right? LinkedIn is your office, Instagram is the club, you know? So you have to act differently. You have to act differently, but I'm telling you right now, LinkedIn and Spotify podcasts for a lot of this room that hasn't been making is a very big opportunity. Posting three, four times a day on Instagram is a very big opportunity. All this content that I want you to write is a very big opportunity. Content is how you will make your happiness happen. Putting out content is how you will make your happiness. Whether that's build a big business, whether that's get a dream job, a collaboration, content, talking, content is how you'll make your happiness happen. The problem is I need you to look inside yourself and tell me why you're not doing it. To me, what I've learned in the last five or seven years, I can sit here for half an hour and give you every detail. I can tell you right now that if you go into your explore page on Instagram and click on every one of those videos and then go leave a comment on that post, a thoughtful comment, watch the video or picture, not just hey or an emoji, look at it and spend two minutes and leave a comment that if you do that 30, 40, 60, 100 times a day, if you're hungry, if you're ambitious, if you want something, if you do that, I know that will work. It will work. You will grow. You will get more attention. You will get more attention to your business, to yourself. My question is, why won't you do it? My question is, why won't you do it? Will you not leave a comment because you're nervous to leave a comment on somebody who's famous as Paige? Will you not leave a comment because you think somebody's gonna judge your comment? Will you not leave a comment because you don't wanna spend an hour leaving comments? Why? For me, everything is about reverse engineering. What do you want to happen? Like what? What do you want to happen? And then understanding in 2019 that written words, audio, and video on seven platforms can get you there is remarkable. It's just remarkable. It's so crazy to me. What's I'm sitting here listening as I'm talking and I'm literally blown away that I believe it. I mean it. I'm shocked that we are now living at a time where the internet is at scale, the apps that
that dominate the culture are free, you could literally walk out of here right now and start the process of changing the course of your life if you want. And literally the only thing left now, because the excuse of money and time is over. That's amazing. The fact that money and time have been subsidized by the internet because you can lay in bed and do it at 11 p.m. if you want, and the cost is zero. You don't have to buy a store and open it, like zero. It eliminates all your excuses, and now the question is why not? Why are you not? And so I'm very passionate of getting this room today to start thinking about what they want to be doing and how and where and why. I'm breaking it down into audio, written word, videos, and pictures. You know what the five or six platforms are. Now it just becomes the match to get it started. And more importantly, and the biggest thing that I fear, will the group have enough patience to see the results? I was on Twitter from 2007 to 2011 and I replied to every single person that tweeted at me and in the beginning, because nobody knew who I was, I went to Twitter search and I searched the word wine and other wine terms, found people talking about it, jumped into the conversation and left good information. I did that for seven to eight hours a day for four years before anybody gave a fuck about who I was. Let me, let me say that slowly one more time. For seven to eight hours a day, for four years, I would go to Twitter search, search wine terms, jump into them, and give information for four years before anybody gave a fuck who I was. Now I get DMs from people saying, in three weeks I'll get a DM from somebody here saying, Gary, saw you in Jakarta, it was awesome. I started doing stuff, I'm not getting any traction. I reply, that's nice Mario, you've been doing it for three fucking weeks.